Hi, attorney Roy Oppenheim here. Zoom at noon, if you can believe this, this is the 12th week that we are now uh, doing this webinar. Uh, it's already three months. It's hard to believe how much has happened, how much change has occurred in, in this country and around the world. And uh, when we started this, this, this webinar, we thought we would just be helping folks kind of get through and understand what this pandemic situation was going to be and how we were going to exist in it, how we were going to come out of it. And now we actually have new issues to confront as a society and, 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 and as a, really as a, as a village and as a community and as, and as a nation and really as part of the world. And, and uh, of course, now we're dealing with, with um, civil, civil unrest that, that uh, has uh, sprung up here in the United States and actually uh, seems to be uh, uh, occurring in other parts of the, the world uh, in part in sympathy. And uh, before we begin, I do want to thank uh, those who put this program together. Uh, Paula Vergara, of course, uh, has been helping with, with putting these PowerPoints together. And then Ken Morris is going to be joining us again uh, this, this, this week. And of course, I want to thank my, my daughter, Wendy Oppenheim, who's pitching in uh, for Lance, who's actually on assignment. Um, and so the first thing I do want to talk about is that we really are now dealing with two crises. And one of the things I want to talk about, and by the way, if you have questions or comments or disagree with me, you know, this is an open forum. This only really works when I have all of you fully participating. So I ask that, that you do that. And we're going to try and take some disparate points and, and try and integrate them together so that uh, uh, we have a sense of where we're going and how we're going to get out of this and, 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 and what hope there is for us as a society uh, and, 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 and as, a, as really a, a species. Um, one of the things I, I do want to talk about is, is that there is enormous amounts of, of anger and frustration and impatience uh, as it relates to uh, socio-political issues, uh, as it relates to, to the rights of, uh, of black people in the United States. And this is nothing new. It's, it's been around since, since the founding of, of this nation. But clearly, because of the stress that we're all under, the fact that 40 million people are unemployed, the fact that uh, over 20 or 25 percent of the entire population in the United States is unemployed, the fact that, that a much larger percentage of, of people of color and minorities are unemployed, creates a, a very stressful environment and that we all need to be very sensitive supportive of the situation. And certainly in our firm, uh, we all are, are trying to do our part to understand and, 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 and fulfill our, our obligations as, as people that, that need to work together. One of the things I do want to talk about real briefly is that the government has invoked the uh, in Insurrection Act, the 1807 Insurrection Act. And, and, that, and that's a very important point because it allows the U.S. military, uh, which is normally supposed to be only working overseas to protect us, is actually now uh, in our cities and in, in and in, in our public places trying to protect the peace. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's not something that we're accustomed to, and, and it has a, a, a lot of political as, as well as legal implications. And one, just as an aside, and I was talking to, to Ken about this this morning, is that if you ever look at your insurance policies, uh, your commercial insurance policies, you'll see that there are exemptions for rioting and insurrections, but there aren't exemptions for uh, pure vandalism. And so to some extent, if, if these particular flare-ups are deemed uh, acts of vandalism, you will have insurance. But in fact, if you, uh, you know, if these are uh, these uh, crises, these these protests which have become violent uh, are deemed to be forms of insurrection or riots, then in fact, uh, your insurance policies will not cover uh, the repairs, the stolen items. Uh, it will cover plate glass, by the way, because plate glass is always covered. But the fact is that, that there will be lots of legal, legal, legal implications associated with everything that we're talking about today. But I kind of want to move on to the, to the next slide and talk about where we're going and how, how we're going to get there. First thing is we're going to talk about the global spread of the pandemic. Number two, we're going to talk about how schools and sports around the world are dealing with things. And then we're going to talk about the travel and entertainment industry around the world, retail, professional services and industrial production, and then the re reopening pioneers around the world, hotspots, and then in the United States, hotspots, rural areas, remote locations, and what the general takeaways are. Again, I ask all of you to uh, please participate and, and join us in, in any questions or comments. And uh, it makes it a lot easier for me when, when we have that kind of interaction. Uh, again, I wanna thank Ken Morris, who I've known for a long time, is a dear friend. And uh, he's with the South, uh, Morris Southeast Group and, and is just a very competent, competent uh, uh, industrial uh, real estate professional. But more importantly, he's a deep thinker and someone who has uh, a lot to say. And I wanna make sure that, that, we, uh, that Ken can chime in wherever, wherever he wants when the event's possible. Um, uh, let's just go to the next team. I've, I've already introduced Ken, so let's let's go to the next slide if we can. Uh, in our last session, there was a discussion on how to make our comeback a success story remaining relevant and, and solvent. Uh, this week, we're going to discuss what different regions and countries are doing 
to control the pandemic and the results we are starting to see. Uh, Dr. Sanya Gupta you know, had a good comment. He said, there's no vaccine yet. There's no magic therapeutic. There's just each other. And never before uh, we have been so dependent on one another and we must rise to that challenge. Of course, he probably said this before, uh, you know, the riots broke out and, and before, uh, you know, they became violent. And so, you know, we're, what we're doing here is we're going to create further spread by the additional contact that we're all going to have through, through uh, exercising our, our First Amendment rights of free speech. Uh, I want to go to the next page because um, this is really very important. Um, the uh, American Bar Association, uh, the president wrote a beautiful, beautiful letter. I, I'm not going to read all of it, but the end um, is, is really uh, wonderful. And, it, and, it, and, and uh, Judy writes, Public trust must be rebuilt and fortified. Reforms must be introduced. The ABA will join efforts to develop and implement solutions. These tragic events must not define our nation. And we stand unified in uh, the principle of equal justice for all. Um, and I think that that's really important because what we're seeing here is that our legal systems, our institutions are, are beginning to fail us. They're failing us in the sense that they're not protecting people's rights and they're not making sure that people have a fair chance in, in this society. And as lawyers, as officers of the court, we are equally responsible for making sure that we hold our judges, our police officers, uh, our prosecutors uh, to the same standards that, that they ought to be held to. And many times they, they do fail us. At the same time, uh, we cannot uh, assume that everyone is bad or everyone is good. And when it comes to, to, to George Floyd, that situation is, is just unacceptable by anyone's standard. And uh, I think the fact that this is uniform, uni unified outcry is an indication of, of how we all feel. Those individuals who are taking advantage of the situation is, is a completely different situation. I do wanna just uh, go to the next uh, slide, but before I do that, I wanna pull up this picture of, of the police officers taking, taking a, a knee, if we can, is that possible? Great. Uh, I think this says it all. I mean, here we have uh, police officers of all color indicating that they are in solidarity with the rest of us. And, and I hope this isn't just a you know, superficial picture, but in fact, the reality of, of what is, 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 is going to take place and that we're going to come together as, as, as a nation. Um, one of the things that have to happen is that the police need to do a better job hiring. They need to do a better job training. They need to do a better job in, in, in sensitivity training and, and not allowing people to, prejudices and biases to overcome their emotions and do things that, that, that are just unacceptable, illegal, and, and need to be accounted for. Um, at the same time, uh, I want to go to slide nine, if we may. And uh, slide nine is right here. Perfect. Um, ironically, while uh, we are dealing with, with two massive crises that we've never had to really deal with it at, at the same time in our society, or probably even one of this, of this size, uh, in, in any of our lifetimes. We've had a momentous event, and that is where a private company has been able to, to uh, decrease the expense and costs and use new technology to uh, bring two, two astronauts to the space station. And what's more important is this is the first step of, of getting us back to the moon in two years, and supposedly within four years, having us land on Mars. And the reason this is important is while we're seeing that our Earth is a very fragile place and that we all have to get together and that mother nature has the capacity to wipe us out in an instant if she really wants to, whether it's through climate change or, or, or global warming or, or through viruses or not, or, or, or having us all come against each other. The fact is that here's an opportunity for us to perpetuate mankind, to perpetuate uh, humanity, not just on earth, but throughout uh, the universe. And for our Star Trek fans, uh, and can we get Ken on board by the way? Uh, for our Star Trek fans, you know, uh, there is this notion that there are other civilizations out there and, and there's a question and there's a doctor named Dr. Drake who in 1961 posited this, this, this theorem that there would be civilizations all over the universe. The problem is where are they? Why are they not there? And the answer is it's because they end up self-destructing. They self-destruct either because they implode on themselves, they get too smart for themselves, they, they become smarty pants to some extent, or maybe their societies become too interconnected and end up self-imploding self or at the same time could have environmental consequences. And so at the same time as we're seeing you know, existential threats to our very existence, we're seeing this wonderful opportunity for us to expand our vision and, and our universe. I wanna to go to the first question, if I may, and if we can get Ken on, that would be great also. Economic recovery. How long is, it, uh, is, is the Congressional Budget Office suggesting that there's going to be a full national economic recovery? Is it 
one to is it two years, five years, seven years, or ten years? Of course, I can. Can we get? We need to get you on there, Ken. Uh, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Good. Okay, we gotta get you. Your, 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 can we? Well, one is gonna try and figure out how to get to see your lovely mug. But yes, two years, five percent. <laughs> five years, twenty-five percent. Seven years, five percent. And ten years, thirty-three percent. Uh, whoever is saying two years is not up to their latest news. It is actually they're saying now ten years. And the Congressional Budget Office is usually pretty accurate. Unfortunately, we'll go to the next question. Um, if we can, question number two. And Wendy, you're doing a great job. Just relax. Don't, don't get stressed. I don't know how people do this on their own, by the way. I mean, I know some people just run all this on their own. I, I'm, I cannot do that, but that's okay. Florida will eventually rebound in what time period, according to Moody's Analytics? Again, this is fresh off the press. Six to 12 months, 18 to 24, 18 to 24, 24 to 36, or 36 to 60 months. So it's uh, almost immediately, you know, one and a half to two years, two to three years, or uh, three to five years. Most of you are saying 18 to 24 months, and I really hope that you are right, 43%. But right now they're saying it's going to be, it says 36 to 60 months. We uh, really meant their uh, three to five years, which is uh, three to five years. Yeah, six, 36 to, uh, to 60 months is what, what we're saying, um, is what they're saying. And the reason for that is that the, the industry, the, the community will not completely bounce back until the cruise ships are actually at capacity and the airlines are back at capacity and the hotels are back at capacity. And Ken, I'll let you chime in right here if you can. Oh, we're, you're muted. You are muted. Here we go. I'm back. How about that? Yeah, there you go. There, Ken. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, you're Perfect. absolutely right. It, it's all about um, our economy down here is mostly service driven and tourism driven. And uh, I think the one good news point is that people that are living in super urban, highly intense, dense urban environments are going to want to get out of them if they can. And we're already seeing an influx of buyers into single family homes here in South Florida. I think that will help prop up housing prices, but until the hotels are full, until the restaurants are really back open, we have really some distance to travel before our economy gets close to even getting close to where we were even seven years ago. And to your heart, there's a question that just came up. How do you see the protests and potential spread of the virus, both of these crises, further affecting real estate? And I would say in South Florida, you know, let's just leave it there. Well, you know, on, and that's a great question. I would say on the commercial real estate side, it, it's all about cash flow. And cash flow really is all about everything. Cash flow at the consumer level, who can afford to pay their mortgage and pay their rent. You know, on the commercial side, uh, at, if the pandemic is with us for a long time, it is going to have a long time uh, headwind on our economy. Uh, employment is definitely gonna suffer. We're not gonna be able to uh, hire back all of the people that had lost their jobs. Um, you know, the hotel industry, the restaurant industry, uh, many of the services and the service industry uh, uh, enterprises are no longer going to be able to operate they were before. That is the issue related to COVID. COVID may be with us for the next two to three years. It's really up in the air how long it's going to take to have a vaccine, but it's unlikely we're going to have a vaccine anytime in the short time. But let me, let, let, I, I want to interrupt you on two points. One, there's a possibility for a therapeutic response so that it's not as deadly and doesn't cause as much disruption, just like strep throat may be used to cause, and I talked about that before. In addition, in terms of real estate, I think the residential real estate market, the single family residential real estate market may actually see a very strong uh, wind in its back for the reason that you have folks from major metropolitan areas that are really now saying, why do I want to be in a place that's prone to, to disruptions, that's prone to viruses, that's prone to, to moving around on mass transit, that's prone to looting. Why do I need that? Why don't I move to the burbs? And then the, the biggest companies are going to go to hybrid business models where they're going to actually have smaller offices in the burbs. These are the largest companies in the world, I'm talking about, having smaller offices in the burbs where people can work at home yet still have access to some sort of office facility, not that far where they don't have to commute 45 minutes, an hour and a half each way. What do you think of that? Oh, absolutely. It, you know, this has accelerated the work from anywhere trend. That is, that genie is not getting stuff back in the bottle. Uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, open text, 
um, a bunch of other tech companies have all come out and said we're reducing our footprint. We're going to be able to open up our talent pool to everywhere. And if you're a knowledge worker, you can live in a rural environment as long as you have access to high speed bandwidth and you'll be able to still do your job for most of those uh, companies. And that in turn will help lower the cost of living for those knowledge workers. The concern I have on the other side of that coin is what happens to Manhattan real estate and a very urban dense environment, Chicago, New York, uh, and those markets that were built up and many, many millions of square feet of office product around the, the world, especially here in the United States, was built to accommodate those users. And if and, they're restricting and their like, footprint, who's going to replace them? And, and I just want to say, and we're going to move on, is you know, if we look at the world real estate market, we see that sometimes cities and areas have to hit rock bottom before they reinvent themselves. East Berlin, I think I've mentioned previously in these slides, is a perfect example of that, which was virtually a no man's land when the two Germanys unified. And today, if you go to East Berlin and you look at West Berlin, you would think that East Berlin is West Berlin because it is just actually more developed and more beautiful than, than, than Berlin was before uh, the reunification. And so it had hit rock bottom. It became an artist colony first. It, it became a no man's land. And so some of these cities have to almost reinvent themselves and there has to be a rebirth, but that normally happens only after values really, really seek to, to new lows. And then the investors come in, the artists come in, and they reinvent the place. So, so it'll, you know, big cities are, are thriving organic in, uh, organisms, but sometimes they have to shed and they have to go through a, a cocoon and almost go into hibernation before they re-blossom and re-bloom. So I think that's what's going to happen. Well, let's go on to global, global spread. Uh, what you want to know is why one country might be doing better than another and what you can learn from that. Professor Jake Jason Oak from the University of Oxford. So let's see if we can help us all figure this out a little bit. And I don't know if we're going to, going to but we're going to give it a shot. Um, as, we, as we're seeing, we're seeing where the hot spots are, the types of cases are around the world. Uh, South America, clearly right now, because it's winter there, uh, clearly that there's something associated with, with, with weather and with heat and humidity. And so right now, Brazil is, is probably uh, suffering the largest increases day over day. Uh, and uh, still the United States uh, probably still has probably the a lot of the most, most cases. Um, we'll go to slide 12, if we can. Uh, once it was clear that the world was facing a pandemic, the countries of the world basically uh, had to decide whether to lock down or not. And different countries made different decisions on what they were gonna do. Uh, only a handful decided not to lock down, not to lock down at all. And it's kind of interesting to see how they did. Sweden decided to try to attain herd immunity fast and they did not enforce any restrictions and we'll see how, how that turned out. Uh, one of the things that we're also finding is that culture, the way people touch each other, hug each other, uh, and, and, and the way they actually shake hands or greet one another has become probably a major issue in terms of what has worked and what hasn't worked. And we see that some of the Asian countries, for example, uh, because they're so accustomed to wearing masks and that's just part of their culture, seem that possibly to, to have done better. Let's go to question three, if we can. Here we go, question three. Um, for 100,000 deaths in population, which country has the most deaths? And, and most of you are saying the United States. Well, let's see if you're right. China, Belgium, mm -hmm. Sweden, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so most of you are really thinking it's the United States. And, I, and, and in terms of actual cases, that is correct, but that's really not, not, not correct. If we go to slide 14, Uh, we will see that, in fact, Belgium, per 100,000 people, and, that was, and it wasn't a trick question because it, it, it is important, per 100,000 people, Belgium has by far the most, and the United States actually is, is in the middle and is doing about average. Um, and then if we look at herd immunity on the left side, we're seeing what herd immunity would require on the left and what the different cities around the world have achieved, and the answer is no one has achieved herd immunity. And even if we do achieve herd immunity, we don't know how long these antibodies are good for. But even New York, where 20% of the folks have tested positive, as you can see, it's a long way to getting to herd immunity. So our best bet is probably going to be uh, finding some sort of, of vaccine or in the alternative, finding some sort of palliative care that will reduce the, uh, the symptoms of, of, of COVID. Um, we still need ac accurate testing too. That's the problem. The current antibody test is only 50% uh, uh, accurate. And uh, 
you know, that has to be brought uh, brought up significantly in order for it to make any sense from a tracking perspective of where we are, what inning we are in in in, in the you know in, in this process of getting through it. Right. No, I agree. Okay, so Italy was hit hard. They're now opening up. We can go to the next slide. We'll see what they're doing. Uh, millions are returning to work in Italy after a week down, week, week downs of, of weeks of, of lockdown. We're seeing uh, what uh, certain parts of, of Milan look like around the Duomo before and after. As we can see, people are out again and, and doing their thing, and it's a it's a wonderful thing to uh, to see that that's happening. Latin America, as we talked about, is the epicenter now, and and uh, it is uh, you know they're going to suffer uh, probably worse than us because they didn't take this seriously, or some of their leadership did not take this as seriously as they ought to. And it's ironic because they saw what was happening around the rest of the world, but we're, we're not them, so we'll move on. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Schools and sports. I think this is really kind of interesting. Uh, different schools around the world are trying to, to deal with uh, uh, the crisis differently. Uh, children are, are learning to self-test themselves. Uh, countries with higher testing capabilities, such as Germany, are, are testing and, and retesting kids. Uh, and Germany is reducing the cost of testing by training the kids, as I said, to, to test themselves. And in Austria, uh, they'll, the kids are going to be split up in two sessions, and uh, there'll be a half a week for one set of kids, another half for another set. And, and I think Israel is, is looking at something much more complicated and complex to try and out, outsmart the, uh, the virus. Uh, in terms of sports, sports is coming back. Hopefully, professional sports will come back to the United States. It will, in all likelihood, as it's in, in Europe, come back without any fans in the stadiums. And everything's going to rely on, uh, on digital and television and uh, there will not be fans in, in the stadium, and, and the players are going to be quarantined uh, and are, and are going to have to uh, remain tested constantly and, and probably not be allowed to, to go beyond the, their own group so they don't destroy their own, their own quarantine. Next. Travel and entertainment. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and then, uh, thank you. In terms of travel, uh, the pandemic has brought dramatic change. Uh, in terms of open borders, people are being checked constantly. Uh, checkpoints have now been created again. I mean, there was a time in Europe you could go from Switzerland to Germany, Germany to Italy, and you wouldn't even know you were crossing a border. It was, it was almost like not even uh, have to take, you know, moving uh, between, between a toll booth. Um, okay. And, um, and then we can go to the next slide. I think this is interesting. Uh, you know, restaurants in Europe are, are reopening as they are here. A, a lot of the, uh, the Michelin restaurants are trying to figure out how, how they can still provide a, a unique uh, dining experience and at the same time keeping people st safe. For instance, the Netherlands bars and restaurants, uh, they've opened to customers and uh, they'll limit 30 guests inside. Uh, and uh, restaurants in Switzerland are open with a limit of, of four people per table. Okay, I think we have a, 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 the next question that's coming up. Okay. Okay, the, the, the next question, if we can bring it up. No, no, gave it away. Okay, uh, I, well, the question is, what country will drive in theaters uh, with up to 30 people? Can we, can we pull it up? Oh, here we go. What country will allow drive in theaters with up to 300 people in their cars? It's a multiple choice question. Uh, US, Germany, China, or Switzerland. So you can have up to th 300 people at a drive in theater uh, with, with cars. So I don't know that that means only 200 cars or 150 cars. The question is, what country is allowing to do that? And uh, once again, we stumped you. The answer is Switzerland, and this is actually a picture of it right here uh, in Switzerland. You can close the poll. Um, is uh, we're seeing actually drive-ins in, in, in Switzerland, and it's interesting. In, in, in all parts of the world, they're using drive-ins not just for film, but they're going to use drive-in for actual theatrical productions and, and musical productions. And so, I think uh, the car has become uh, our, our our new way of, of of shielding ourselves and being able to still be very mobile. We, can you imagine? Chime in. Yeah, I was yeah, just I was thinking just about saying, uh, about the carbon footprint aspect of it, though. Uh, hopefully, everybody's turning their cars off while they're while they're watching the movie or watching the play. Or um, in the alternative, or in the alternative, everyone will get hybrid cars that can plug in, and electric cars that will allow for you to plug in and therefore run your air conditioner while you're at the drive-in. And so the drive-in could morph into if pushing. Uh, uh, hybrid or, or electric cars because it would be a, a wonderful way for you to be able to go to the drive and plug in your car, not run your motor and not pollute you know, society. And so it really depends how this is going to fly, but this, this could put a major boost in for, uh, for, for electric vehicles. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see if that's just a fad or if that's something that's going to be long-term. One hope so. 
We have a question, I'm gonna to go to it. Do you think that the widening social and economic disparity is one of the gestating elements of the unrest? Um, and then, uh, the, uh, and then the, the individual who asked the question says, I postulate that the massive layoffs are a thinning of, of the herds. They've been waiting to do for quite some time and now have this event and opportunity to do so. The major reason why about half the jobs will not be returning. Thoughts? Thoughts are that, that I, I think that these protests would normally occur after uh, the type of murder that we all saw in front of us. Some people call it a lynching. Um, regardless of that, I think that there's no question that the 40 million people that are unemployed, the fact that, that such a high percentage of the United States is, is unemployed, that so many people of color are, are, are unemployed, adds so much frustration, so much anger, so much impatience, and so is fuel to, to an existing fire that, that may have already been burning, but now we're putting fuel on the fire. And then they don't forget there are other people who want us to be fighting. There are outsiders, there are people around the world who, who want to agitate, they're one of people who want to take advantage. And so this is all an opportunity for people to try and get into the game and, and try and create this massive disruption. So, so I think, yes, I think the answer is that, that, that the COVID, it, this COVID environment is, is, is just so rife and, and so opportunistic for, for this type of crisis. And those of you who've been watching, I think Ken was on, the first time Ken was on, we talked about civil unrest being a likely consequence of COVID. It is, it's, it's, it's happened in history and, and it's, and, and it was just expected. And so how it was going to happen, what, the, what, the, what, what was going to set it off, you never know. It's always, always going to be some sort of exogenous event. World War I was caused by an exogenous event. So typically, these are the situations that, that you have to watch out for. And we need to continue to watch out for it and make sure that at the same time, our, our, our political rights, our economic rights, as, as well as our constitutional rights are not infringed upon and that the Constitution's corners are not chipped away at and frayed by this crisis. And that's why lawyers such as ourselves need to be vigilant and, and we need your support in that context. Let's go to airlines if we can. Uh, oh, there's a question. How do you see the protests and potential spread of the virus further affect real estate? I, I think we kind of alluded to it. I think there's going to be a further migration of people from the city. I mean, I know from, from cities in general. So for example, I know realtors who were selling real estate in Manhattan and they now have partnered with people who sell real estate in the burbs and they are now assisting their clientele in the city who they would normally take from one bedroom to two bedroom to maybe a three bedroom to actually leaving the city and going into suburban communities. And so we're seeing it happen in real time, uh, at least I am. And so um, I think that's gonna continue. Those folks who are you know, in Broward County, Palm Beach County, um, I think we're gonna benefit on the residential side because we're going to have so many folks from cities around the United States and the world who are gonna find the way we are spaced out and the way the car is still the focal point of, of, of the way we travel and commute to be very, um, I, I think, advantageous and, and admirable under the current circumstances. And so I think both crises are, are lending a hand to the historic suburban uh, American dream uh, classic context. Okay, uh, look, we didn't talk about airlines. Okay. So airlines are trying to do everything touchless. Uh, you know, even when you check in now, you're gonna check in on your phone, you're not gonna hit any of their stuff anymore. And uh, you know, that's just something that, that, that's gonna happen. Um, let's go to cruise lines if we can. This is a picture of a, of a cruise. Uh, basically, cruises are only gonna be allowed to be functioning at, at, at half capacity. Uh, this is a picture of Arosa Cruise Lines, an Italian cruise line. They were supposed to set sail June 1st. Uh, apparently, that did not happen. But this is, this is how they, they're, they're their ship was, was re, reconfigured, and it's the first ship that was gonna be reconfigured. Here in the United States, we don't expect ships to be sailing up, you know, in the next few months, although maybe they will be, and if they are, they, they can't be profitable if they're only gonna be operating at 25 or 50% capacity. Uh, another 20, slide 28. Uh, new procedures, oh, this is great, new procedures, you know, uh, you're gonna to have to sign your life away with all kinds of waivers. Uh, you're gonna be signing, uh, you know, all kinds of declarations. Uh, there's gonna be no cash used on board. There's gonna be mandatory social distancing. And the best thing is some cruises will allow, uh, will give you an extra room for free to bring your kids. Uh, and uh, maybe that will be fun. Maybe it won't, depends on your, uh, your state of mind. Ken, what's your thought? Uh, my thought is, is, is that maybe cruising is going to morph back away from the older retiree population, which is more susceptible to COVID. Yeah, there. That's typically the population that has comorbidities like diabetes and high blood pressure and other factors that COVID, uh, you know, inflammatory disease. 
uh, it'll be interesting because on most of those cruise ships, except for like a Disney cruise, it's mostly older folks that love to cruise. Uh, it may be interesting to see, we might have more families and young families on cruise ships. Uh, and many of the older people may not be, uh, uh, be willing to participate until things change or we have a, a vaccine or some kind of treatment. And, and it may not be, and it may not be that they may not want to participate. They may not be allowed to participate because some of these waivers that you're going to have to state, you're going to have to self-assess what kind of health conditions you are. So if you have diabetes, if you are, you know, obese, if you have high blood pressure, if you have other heart conditions, uh, you may be excluded from being allowed to cruise. And that's a large percentage of, of our population. I hate to say. And it's a disproportionate pop and a disproportionate percentage of our cruising. Who population. cruises? Right. Who right. cruises? Right. Another great question here. Do you think there will there will be will there become uniform laws regarding responses to COVID as opposed to the state level? Uh, it, the only the only folks who would have the capacity to do that would be the CDC, and all they ever do is proclaim uh, best practices and suggested practices. And so it's going to be at the state and local level that we're going to see. Uh, particular mandates how uh, companies, whether it's a restaurant, nail salon, or even an office, uh, get involved with their with their social spacing. Um, I would hope so, though. I mean, it really we need to have some kind of federal legislation, uh, you know, uh, across the United States that provides some kind of safe harbor uh, language that helps offset liability for businesses. Uh, right now, if you open up your business you are taking a risk because there is no safe harbor. Uh, you have to do everything that the CD says, CDC says and more, and even then you're not limiting your exposure. Now, right. and, and, and so anybody that's why, can do anybody for anything, but uh, do you really wanna go through that? Right, and that's why you wanna make sure when you renew your insurance policies to see if there's gonna be a COVID exclusion, a, a, a pandemic exclusion, or if they're gonna be uh, additional riders that you may have to pay extra for to buy the protection to make sure you're protecting your customers and to some extent your, your, your employees or your vendors. So these are all the things that, that uh, as employers uh, that we all need to be mindful of. I want to go on to Airbnb. You'll find this interesting, Ken, you may know this, that you know, worldwide uh, between March 10th and 20th, uh, there was a 30% decrease in new short-term rental reservations compared to the same time in February. And in Europe, that number jumped to 80 or to 90%. So the, the decrease in Europe was 80 to 90 percent, in the United States it was only 30 percent. And the main reason for that is we had urban dwellers who were moving out of cities temporarily to rent homes outside the city, so they would have more more outdoor space and and, and not feel as as congested. And a lot of that real estate was purchased by those, those vacation rentals and their Airbnb rentals were were highly leveraged and. Uh, there's some evidence now that those owners are going to be selling their properties because they can't afford to hold on to them. And if more enough of them hit the market, you're going to see a valuation impact. Oh, I, 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 absolutely. It's just a matter of, of, of time, and especially since you have to spend more time in between uh, people spend, you know, spending time at your, at your Airbnb and you're going to have to lose a day or two in, in between, uh, between uh, rentals. Uh, I want to go on to retail because retail is 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 a very interesting proposition, especially uh, I'm talking about brick and mortar retail. Uh, malls malls have begun to reopen uh, in, in in Spain as as well as here in the United States. You know, temperatures are being checked. They're creating one way. Uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, they're they're, they're creating. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, we're we're seeing. Um, you know, what happened to that page? Okay. Uh, if we can go to this, this next slide here, we're seeing actually one way uh, directions for people going into supermarkets and malls. You go in one way, you come out another way. Uh, this, I, I think, was in, in uh, not sure where this is. This is in Aldi in Germany. Uh, and uh, people are spacing themselves and waiting in, in, they, in, in their directional lines. But I think we're also having that here, here and now in, in the United States. But, but the, the social experience of shopping is changing dramatically. And, uh, you know, it's, it, a lot of people are just finding it easier just to order on Amazon. But, but there still will be opportunities for, for, for uh, brick and mortar shopping. It just won't, won't be the same like, like it once was. Question, we have a whole bunch of questions. Have you seen much outflow from downtown Miami area to the suburbs? Uh, Ken, what do, you, what do you think on that so far? Not yet, I think it's too early to see that. Um, and I think a lot of the downtown Miami uh, product, the condo product, you know, the super urban dense 
uh, are second and third homes for foreign residents. Um, a little too early in the game to see that. I think we are seeing an inflow of people from outside of the state, from New York, from Chicago, from the Midwest, super intense urban environments that are looking to deploy uh, their money here. And our real estate somewhat is less expensive than what they're used to seeing in those markets. So uh, it's a bit of a bargain. So um, right now, the, the issue that I'm hearing from my residential brokerage colleagues is that there's no product on the market. The people that own the houses generally don't want to sell right now. And there's a lot of demand for obvious reasons. Right. I, I, I think it, it's a seller's market, but the problem is the sellers don't know where they are going to go. Where are they going to go? Right. Exactly. I think it's a kind of interesting problem, especially for the realtors, because there's just not enough inventory for, for the number of realtors that we have. Uh, one of the questions is, you know what percentage of South Florida real estate was specifically bought by a Air, for a Airbnb purposes or vacation rentals? The answer is that it, that's going to be a lucrative market, particularly this winter, uh, just like the folks who are, are, are in the Hamptons right now. And the Hamptons went crazy, as many of you may know. Uh, you know rentals there have shot up uh, to levels that they've never seen. Those same folks uh, may not want to stay in, in, a, in a northern climate for, for the winter and will probably want to shift that, that experience down towards South Florida. And so I, I see rentals uh, for single family homes in, in, in upscale areas, uh, probably near, near the coast to, to do quite well uh, this coming season. Um, now I'm not talking about short term rentals, I'm talking about one month, two month, entire seasonal, seasonal rentals, anything more than a month. Uh, do you think commercial real estate market will ever be what it was? What is going to happen to all the office spaces as more people work remotely? You know, that, that is a wonderful question of how we reposition the excess capacity. And uh, Ken and I talk about that all the time. Uh, Ken, I'll give you first dibs. Well, I think that's a great question. And I think the jury is still out. I think a lot of the metrics that we're all looking for haven't been written yet. I think we'll know a little bit more, you know, in the fourth quarter and maybe first quarter of next year. I do predict that the, the average enterprise, whether it's a large company or an entrepreneurial company, uh, publicly or, or private, are going to reduce their footprints because work from anywhere, we have the technology now, it does work, it's proven to work. A lot of people don't want to go back to the office because they're afraid to, or they just like working from home. There are a few gung-ho people, 25%, 40%, maybe that just love the interaction with other human beings in the work environment, they're going to be the ones that are going to rotate through. Uh, they're going to be a more hybridization of offices where people will convene for specific reasons and rotate in and rotate out. But the average footprint, in my opinion, will reduce by 25 to 50%. With that said, there will be a few large fortune size companies, 100, 500 companies, that, are, that have the cash that will expand their footprint to show, hey, we can still occupy in a physical space and we're gonna stretch our workstations and work areas out and that's why we're expanding our footprint. But I predict that is not gonna be the norm. Right. So, so I think that, and I, but yeah. I think that the, the big cities are gonna see the hit first. I think yes. nice office buildings, class A office buildings in suburbia, uh, people will take less space. And, but they will create that hybrid kind of environment uh, to be closer to where their, their uh, workers are, are generally uh, switching back and forth from working at home and working office. The problem with working in the office right now is if you have to follow the CDC guidelines and wear a mask, it's hard to talk on the phone. It's hard to wear the mask all day. Uh, you know, people wear glasses, their glasses fog up, and, and people just find it a nuisance over, you know, after a few hours. And so I think that once we are able to get over the COVID phase, it's not like everyone comes running back, but if we can remove the masks and not have to worry about how we get people up in the elevators, I think there could be, you know, some movement back towards towards people being in the office more, but it's not going to be like it once was. I think everyone is now saying that. We have another question here. Many people in East Miami have a genuine concern about rising sea levels and severe flooding. They sure do. Uh, I've lectured on the, the economic long-term impact on, on a sea level the rise. Sorry? They ought to be. They ought to be concerned about it. It's a real issue. It, it's. It's not going to be fifty or sixty or seventy years out. It's really, you know, it's here now and it's getting worse. Um, the king tides uh, twice a year. I mean, even off of Las Olas, they have fish swimming up certain certain streets, 
and um, you know there's no way to, to solve that problem. So it's really going to be an issue, and it's ultimately going to impact uh, impact valuations for that East Miami Miami Beach. Uh, there was a study done about five or six months ago that the average uh, residential uh, property value had dropped by seven percent in Miami Beach due to sea level rise. Really. I, I didn't know that. that that's interesting. But I, I would, it, we've talked about it would start to have some impact at, at some point in time. And uh, I think now after this crisis, people may reassess that. But people still love the water. They still love the sun. And uh, as long as uh, you can get mortgages and as long as you get insurance, uh, those properties will, will still uh, be available for some time. Another question. Will real estate brokerage franchises fare better than privately owned brokerages going forward? Ben, what do you think on that? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, there is some thought with safety and numbers, but I, I think it, it, it's hard to say. Um, I think everybody that's in the brokerage business, you know, has to rely on their personal reputation and the blocking and tackling that they do on a regular basis to, to, to make money and to do what, what we do, which is listing and selling or, or leasing properties. Um, um, I've evaluated going with a national franchise brand several times over the years. And for one reason or another, I've never really pulled that lever when I could have, because I felt that my own brand was enough for the type of practice that I have moving forward. The whole business model of brokerage is going to continue to be under continued strain and compression due to technology. There's ongoing technological advances, virtual reality, and, and you know, seamless transaction platforms that are trying to disintermediate the human being from the process. We're never going to go away fully from the process. They're always going to need humans. But it's hard to say whether running your own enterprise under Ken Morris or versus Colwell Banker it's really hard to say. It depends on what kind of business that you're I, 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 I will tell you what's interesting is while the large uh, retail brands of brokerage historically had done well because of name recognition and the profit margins were fairly decent for the broker, I will tell you today because we represent some folks in that, in that, in that area uh, that the margins have become thin. They've had to figure out new ways to generate income, whether it's by, coming, by, by affiliating with a mortgage brokerage or affiliating with a title company. That the, that the income solely from the brokerage uh, stream is no longer as lucrative as it once was. And I think the reason for that is because of technology and because of the cost of, of, of lead generation and that anyone can get leads, whether you're a big name or not, by going to a third party. And so, so I think there's a question, at the, particularly for the franchisees, if they're better off being uh, alone or versus Paying, uh, paying the franchisees. We have two more questions before we move on. So would your insurance cover if your property goes underwater due to sea level, such as at a replacement value, even if you can't rebuild there? Interesting question. The answer is, of course, you have flood insurance and flood insurance will cover part of it. Depends, you know, if you do have flood insurance, how much flood insurance you have. Uh, and so uh, if frankly, once it becomes a real threat, you won't be able to get flood insurance anymore because that's how insurance works. When you need it, you can't get it. And so uh, the only time you do get it is when it, it's something that, that was unexpected. So the flood happens tomorrow, you'll get it. But if the flood happens 10 or 20 years from now, you probably won't, won't have flood insurance. And it'll, that will be the time that values will, will start to diminish. Let me ask the next question. Do you think downtown Fort Lauderdale real estate will decrease due to current protests? Or do you think there will be new laws to control the protests overall due to the virus? I, you know, I think the protests will continue. But like all protests, have, you know, we've had protests in major cities over the years, Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami, New York. I don't think the protests in and of themselves will, will affect real estate value. I, I agree. I don't think the protests will affect values at all. Um, I think the protests, you know, peaceful protest is, is part of our, the fabric of our nation. And I think it's okay. There's plenty of protests that have happened all around our country uh, over the years. And, 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 uh, it, and, and know, I just want to add that, you know, pro protesting is, 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 a, is part of the fabric of our society. That's how our country was founded. And so, right. you know, those who are peacefully protesting and marching, whether it's against an issue or against their government, you know, that, that's what makes our, 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 our country so great. And now the violence is a different issue, and I'm not going to get into that, but obviously none of us propose, you know, support that. And, and that's just, you know, a, a different issue. And that's just a very small group of people who are, who are, who are trying to create an, an incendiary divide among our nation. 
But the protests, I, I think they enhance the community. It shows that people believe in, in our nation and, and, and want change. And, and so I, I think it'll have no impact whatsoever. It may have an impact though on large cities that are dealing with COVID because this is just like another nail in the coffin of I've had it, I'm done, and, and want to move on. Uh, okay, professional services and, 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 and industry. Okay, okay. Uh, slide 34. Uh, Okay, so in, this is, a, this I think, is somewhere in, in East Asia. We're seeing additional government-mandated measures in China, opening office windows three times a day. Unfortunately, a lot of our office windows, Ken, were designed without being able to open office windows. You should check yeah, those true. architects, by the way. It's just, it's just crazy because that's like putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. I mean, it's really, it really comes down to the design of the movement of air throughout any, any space. We've talked about it before. There's going to be a massive amount of capital expenditure that's going to be required to fix that issue um, and how airflow is moved through uh, is really gonna be paramount to how a space is designed and how you as an occupant or a tenant is gonna look at a space moving forward. You're gonna ask questions, say, well, how is the air clean? How is it disinfected? And opening up a window three times a day <laughs> seems rather medieval in my opinion, but I like it. But, you know, the CDC is telling you to do it. And if, if, when you rent a car, they tell you to open all the windows and air out the car. I mean, it's just pure logic that you would do that. Yeah. So, um, and then here we're talking about they're suspending fingerprinting and also they're not allowing people to have lunch face to face. I mean, all common stuff. But unfortunately, uh, page 35 here, we're seeing the plexiglass. Plexiglass, you know, it kind of reminds me of The Graduate, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, um, Dustin Hoffman is, is in the pool and he's, or he's at a cocktail party and some guy goes over to him and says, you know, Son, plastics, plastics. Yeah. Well, guess what? Yeah. He left out. He left out the prefix. Yeah. Plexi, glass, plastic. Well, but but I will I will I will state that it is not exactly what it's been. Uh, it, it may be a temporary solution, but the way it is cleaned, it has to be cleaned on a on a just a rotating, regular basis for it to actually do what it's supposed to be. And you know, it all, it all goes back to airflow and no. Uh, most uh, commercial uh, air handler units do not have a UV component to it. Uh, there, that technology exists, but for the most part, it, it's not installed, except in maybe in a, in a healthcare setting, like a hospital or an outpatient surgical center. You and and that's interesting, because we are, we are finding that UV light, whether it's natural sunlight or, or UV light, you know, kills this, this kind of virus. So that may be one of, one of the, the solutions. It's interesting right. in China that one of the things they're doing, you may have seen, Ken, is that teams of workers are like almost potting together. They're going to work together. They're going to live together, kind of like team, like, like, like professional uh, uh, sports teams, that they're going to stay together and they're going to end up almost quarantining together. And so they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll be able to keep working. I don't know how many people here and, you know, culturally in this country want to live with the people that they go to work with. I mean, uh, you know, that's uh, maybe culturally in Asia that might work, but... I'm not so sure about, you know, over here, right. um, you know, that, 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 that's a bit of a stretch for, uh, for us wildcat, uh, Americans. Anyway, if anyone has any more questions, I suggest you put them in now because we only got about 10 minutes left and I want to give everyone a shot at answering and asking any questions. Uh, one of the new challenges is going to be contact tracing. We're finding that that's been very effective, you know, in terms of how certain societies, uh, particularly, uh, over in the far East have been able to, to mitigate, uh, the, the COVID infections. Um, I want to go to page 37 again. Uh, this is yours, Ken. Real estate trends, virtual tours. Uh, Germany's largest uh, property portal uh, uh, currently has 16,000 property listings that they're featuring on virtual tours. These are 3D tours, tours that really go way beyond anything that we've seen here. Uh, and then uh, in, in Britain, we're seeing the same with British uh, with, with right move. Uh, and then we have these startups that are really doing unbelievable 3D uh, uh, presentations and, and so at some point you will probably put on a virtual headset and it'll be as if you're actually walking through the uh, the home and you won't know the difference. What do you, what do you say to that? I agree 100%. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of property tours are now done using Matterport here in the United States. I've used it to market some of my assignments. Uh, it is amazing and you know more people are going to have you know like Oculus. We have a couple of Oculus units at home. It is amazing when you put that that visor on, you, you feel like you're there. Uh, yes, you know, you're not gonna know whether or not at four o'clock in the afternoon, whether the master bedroom of that house is gonna get super hot. 
You're only going to know that if you walk through it, but it will enable you as the consumer, or let's say you're an executive and you want to lease a, a space, you can walk through it. You can get a general feel before you even get out into the, the real world and you're saving a tremendous amount of time, which is money that you don't have to go look at things that you don't need to see. So, and I'm just going to add here, and we'll talk about this next week is, um, there's this move afoot to rent homes on a, on a permanent basis. And so if you're going to rent a home, the likelihood is you're not going to do, if you're especially from out of town, going to do a walkthrough until you, until you actually move in and you'll, and you'll rely on these kinds of tools to, to choose a home that you're going to move into that you're renting. And you may rent it for one year, five years, 30 years. I mean, just like in New York, people rent homes for 30 years. I, I think my folks were in an apartment for 30 years. And so the reality is that a lot of the rental decisions, even of, of a permanent home, will be done online initially. And so this, this will be a move that's going to take off. Very and, and, that, and that itself will put pressure on the Brokerage community, uh, yes. both commercial and residential. A absolutely. I want to talk about the legal system a little bit, what's going on. First of all, here in Broward or, or, or the state of Florida, more importantly, uh, the governor did uh, extend the moratorium on, on the evictions and foreclosures. It goes now till July 1st. That, that happened last night. People weren't sure what the governor was going to do, but certainly under this climate that we're, we're in, this tense social, political, economic climate, uh, it was obviously the right decision to do. And uh, we're not sure how long that's going to last. And once it stops, there will be a floodgate that will open. There will be a tsunami. There will be an avalanche of initially evictions and subsequently foreclosures. And again, that's where bankruptcy is going to become important. And that's when you all are going to have to you know, find your life raft and call lawyers like ourselves to uh, make sure that you're properly protected here. Another question. We're currently operating under the assumption that the treatment and our vaccine are not in our near future. Uh, well, it depends how you define near future. I know Ken is very tied to the medical community. Well, Ken, I'll let you react to that. Yeah, my sister happens to be a top infectious disease doctor, so it's not my knowledge. It's, it's knowledge uh, in talking with her, and she's on the front lines treating COVID patients uh, in Miami every day at Jackson. Um, and she is flown around the world to give lectures on various tropical diseases. So she has a network of uh, physicians, or infectious disease physicians around the world that she communicates with on a daily basis. And right now, the, the current thinking is that a vaccine is going to be a, probably a 12 to 18 month, if we're lucky, type process. That doesn't mean someone might not have a breakthrough tomorrow, but given how vaccines are difficult to pin down, uh, it's going to take some time. So be prepared for that. And even if they had a vaccine tomorrow, you can't put it in production and get it to everybody overnight. It takes months and months and months to distribute and so forth. And it depends on, there's, there's a lot of channels that have to go through and who gets the vaccine and when and how fast they push it through, what kind of side effects, there's a lot to go through when it comes and, to a vaccine. And the politics and the economics that's going to go into play of who gets it, who pays for it, one country is going to not give it to another country. I mean, we saw this already with, with, right. with the masks and, the, and the pumps and everything else. There was a huge battle and people were holding back. You're going to see that again. And so even once there is a, a, a vaccine, who are you going to give it to first? Who's going to get it first? We're all not getting it right away and we should not have that expectation. So it's going to be a two to three year cycle by the time uh, everything works out and has and things have to work out pretty well for it to be two to three years. But I'm, I'm counting that, that, that within two years, we'll, we'll be very close to being out of, out of this mess. And, and there could be something earlier, but to get it distributed, you know, to, to billions and billions of people on the planet is, is, is a huge, huge project. And that's why I think the U S government says called this project warp speed. Um, I, I, in terms of legal developments, other courts around the world are trying to deal with it in different ways, postponing trials and, and, and Spanish lawyers are suing uh, the government, uh, you know, for not handling things well. I, you know, some of that's going to fly by the wayside, but you know, it, it, it's a nominal interest. I, I think uh, construction is rebounding, Ken. You know, that's something that's important. I think that you know, you, you're, you're closer to that than I am, probably. Uh, well, there, there's a fair amount of construction that was already ongoing. I think that uh, most of the contractors that I work with on a regular basis are busy right now but their pipelines start to thin out in the next three to six months. And after that, they have some serious concerns about what's next. And again, there's no need for 
renovation or new buildings unless there's a demand pattern for it. And I think, again, the metrics that we're looking for really haven't been written yet. I think there will be some infrastructure projects, you know, for roads and, and, and government buildings and so forth that we're likely to see happen. But new office buildings, I don't predict that. Um, residential housing, there's still a demand pattern for it. Uh, here in South Florida, we're almost out of land. So we're not going to see a whole lot of large residential developments. Uh, but you're seeing a lot of urban infill or suburban infill kind of projects happen. And I want to just and go over. And they're going to do. And they're going to do what? Well. Yeah. No. I. I. I think that is that is the case. Uh, reopening pioneers. I want to talk about what's going on in the states a little bit. Uh, as we can see, uh, there's been movement from March 23rd to April 7th in terms of how states shut down. And now, if we uh, overlay that with with there, that what de where demonstrations are occurring, riots are occurring, uh, protests are occurring throughout the United States. It's really in almost every major urban urban center th throughout the country. And, and, and the concern for that, of course, is the respreading of, of COVID and how that's going to affect the social distancing that we were doing a decent job at. And, and this may well set us back a bit. But, you know, it is summer, and so uh, it, it may not set us back as, as far, but no one really knows for sure. Um, uh, and, of course, the great news is people are back at hairdressers, and, and, and so that's kind of exciting for, for some people. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I want to talk about uh, Georgia leading the way on reopening a state that was hit hard by virus. Interestingly, Georgia has not yet seen a, a, an uptick on, uh, on COVID. Other states uh, that are also opening haven't. I mean, I, we're, we're all concerned about the Ozarks for sure because of, the, of some of the pictures. Let's see if we have some of those coming up. Uh, let's talk about the hot spots here. Um, and uh, thank you. We're seeing you know, all, all quite, a picture, quite a picture from the Ozarks. Yes, yeah, there's a, let, let's go to that picture if we can. Like that that still, uh, still resonates in my in my brain it is, it is. let's see i think i think we had it in here somewhere maybe maybe it maybe it fell out um yeah in the rural areas okay we have a question that's that's uh that's, want to know what state has uh, the least cases let me pick up that question which three states have the least covid 19 cases and deaths alaska hawaii montana oh everyone's okay north dakota iowa nebraska Yeah. Okay. These questions are getting harder, I guess. Okay. Uh, Tide, Alaska, Hawaii, Montana, North Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska, Hawaii. Okay. The answer, half of you basically said Alaska, Hawaii, Montana, and that is the answer. Those three states are, are, are open right now. Restaurants are open again. Hawaii, of course, didn't allow any tourists in. They're like Key West. They, they kind of just closed the whole place down. Alaska, I think, just doesn't have that many people coming in, and so they didn't have to spread. And Montana is just so sparsely populated that that they, uh, they too were able to, to, I think, bite the bullet. Um, but the grizzly bears are, you know, they're there concerned okay. about the they, grizzly they bears. That picture of the Ozarks. There we go. Okay. There you go. So, so <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Uh, this is really in the same region of the United States, in, in the Ozarks. Uh, you have a group of, of, of farmers uh, who are literally uh, spacing them, themselves as they, as they pick uh, fruits and vegetables. And then we have right next door the college kids and everyone else who have just ignored social distancing and, and think this is a, a pre-COVID world. And uh, there now have been cases, uh, there are uh, folks who are now trying to figure out who was at these parties because they have to contact everyone and make sure that they know that they, they need to quarantine them themselves and see what happens. Uh, remote locations, Alaska, Hawaii, and Montana, as we said, uh, they've done a remarkable job, but again, they're very spaced out and, and you can't compare a place like these three states to uh, uh, New York or, or, or Philadelphia or some other place. Um, this is Hawaii. Uh, all travelers are required to stay home or in their hotel room for 14 days after their arrival. And uh, they, they really tried to enforce that. And so that, that's been very, very helpful. Um, got two more questions here and then we're going to run out of time. Uh, how do you think property taxes will play out? Well, in, in, in Florida, property taxes are assessed as of January 1, 2019, as of January 1, 2019, uh, it was a normal year. There was no COVID going on. So the answer to your question is, what is January 1, uh, 2021 going to look like? I mean, January, tw January 1, 20, 2020 was, was normal, not in 2019. So 2020 was fine. COVID came around, hadn't affected prices on January 1. January 1, 2021 will have an impact. It will likely only reflect itself on the tax bills for August, September 2021, and not in 
uh, August, September of this year. And that's going to be a problem for some people because it's going to be much more than their property is worth. And, and they're just going to have to un unfortunately just deal with it and then just appeal it uh, for this year or, or appeal the following year. Since the governor is not allowing evic evictions, is there any recourse for the landlord to collect rent? Is the state responsible for letting tenants stay? Uh, and the answer to that question is uh, you got to try and work it out with your tenants for the time being. Uh, and I don't know if the state's going to reimburse landlords for tenants that are not paying. Uh, there is this, this whole idea of rent holidays and, 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 and rent res restrictions and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a tenuous question as, as we speak. And it's not good for, for business in general for tenants not to pay their rent. A contract is, has to be a contract. That is a core tenant of, of business law in exchange for the last several hundred years. So this itself is a pressure point moving forward on what happens with the economy. I, I do want to remind people that on the Oppenheim Law Dot com website. We have a COVID page that has a lot of resources and, and, and answers and, and also questions to, to what you're asking today. And sometimes we have the answers, sometimes we can direct you in the right direction, but it is a page that we're trying to keep up to date. Um, and, that, and I think I also want to just mention that, you know, in terms of our title company, we're, we're constantly doing remote closings. We're constantly doing online closings and, and, and mobile closings, and we're trying to respect our clientele's uh, desire as well as our own to stay healthy and, and to stay safe. So the big takeaways is uh, the virus has reminded us that the world, uh, that health problems are multifactorial. Timing, consistency, and enforcement of policies is key to control of the spread. There's no one size fits all. Balancing the economy and the restrictions seems to be the hardest issue, as well as, of course, dealing with the social political overlay of, of massive, massive unemployment and what impact that has on, on our ability to function as a, as a democracy and as a capitalist democracy. Um, finally, uh, this was uh, Queen Elizabeth. I think we quoted her once before. This time we join with all nations. Sorry. That was my assistant calling. She should have been there. Okay. This time we join with all nations across the globe in a common endeavor using the great advances of science and our in instinctive compassion to heal. We will succeed and the success will belong to every one of us. We will be with our friends again, we'll be with our families again, and we will meet again. And I think we need to have that fortitude, we need to have that hope, we need to understand that if we could put two men in space, and bring the rocket back, and, and to do it at a fraction of a cost of what we were paying before, and then send them to, to the moon, and then to Mars, we can certainly, certainly overcome this crisis, as well as the discord that we're having in society right now. As a group of people together, as Americans, we'll be strong. We always start off slow, but we're going to get stronger and we probably have to hit bottom before we we're able to turn this all around and uh, i think that uh, that will happen and um, i'm very confident that we'll see you next week at zoom and noon for number 13. god bless and have a great week thank you